Forward and Out has been made possible by the generous support of the following. The Loft, Lesbian and Gay Community Services Center. ARC's AIDS-related community services. Stephanie's Living Room. Psychological Motivations. In the Life. The Coven Cafe. Carol Halbert, Licensed Associate Broker. Bars Club Cafe. The Color Group. Mary Elizabeth Edelman Photography. Reverend Troy Perry, founder of the Metropolitan Community Church, has said of our guest on this episode of Forward and Out, he exemplifies the best of what a Roman Catholic priest should be. He will go down in history for his determination not to live a lie, for coming out as a gay man, for speaking the truth about gay, the gay and lesbian community, and for refusing to bow to the pressure of even the Vatican in his quest to see justice done to all God's children. I'm Sandra Gonzalez. Welcome me in joining Father John McNeil. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you for Thank being you. with us today. Um, well, obviously, um, the two achievements for which you're best known are helping to found Dignity and The Church and the Homosexual, the book you wrote 16 years ago. Yeah. Um, that book is in its fourth reprinting now, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, and it's out in six different languages. Is it? Yeah. Mm. Um, well, probably the best place to start is at the beginning. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your background. Um, your decision to become a priest, when did that come about? Well, I, I grew up in Buffalo, New York in an Irish Catholic family and uh, always the priesthood was always there, the thought of it, uh, but it... Uh, did, have, did that have to do with your upbringing or was that just yes. a personal choice on uh, your Both part? upbringing and I think with my gayness uh, and when I was a child, if you were aware of your gayness and I was from childhood, mm -hmm. uh, the priesthood was about the only way to go in a sense, you know, because you could, uh, you wouldn't have to be out of the closet and you could live a celibate life. And, uh, mm -hmm. Well, you, and, saw, you and thought I, that then. Yeah. I know that that changed later on. Yes, uh, but I, I really appreciated uh, the religious values uh, attracted me. And I was uh, in the Second World War as an infantryman and I was captured and I was in prison camp. And while I was in prison camp, I had one incident where an Eastern European saved my life. He threw me a potato when I was starving, mm -hmm. uh, risked his life in the process. Yeah. And when I gestured a thanks, he blessed himself. And mm. that to me became a great symbol of courage, courage to be ready to risk your life in terms of your faith and your uh, belief. And uh, so I wanted to be courageous like he was courageous. And so I, I prayed for that gift all my life. Mm -hmm. Now, when you returned from Europe after the war, is that when you began your religious training? Yes. Well, I went to Canisius College in Buffalo, completed my college, and then in 1948, I entered the Society of Jesus and began my, began my training as a Jesuit priest. And I was in the Jesuits for 40 years. You were in the Jesuits for 40 years? Yes, I was. Um, so the beginning of your ministry then 
as a Jesuit priest, was a very traditional ministry. Yeah. yeah. Would, yeah. Were you in New York at the time, or? Oh uh, no, uh, actually, I, I for the first fourteen years of my training, uh, I was successfully celibate. Uh, but when I went to Europe to do doctorate studies, I found myself compulsively acting out. Uh, uh, my sexual needs as a gay man. Mm -hmm. uh, I prayed very hard over that. And then shortly after I returned from my doctorate studies, uh, I met uh, uh, my lover, Charlie. Mm -hmm. uh, at With a bar, whom you're still? <laughs> at a bar called the St. Charles Bar. He never lets me forget. <laughs> and, That's appropriate. And, <laughs> and we have been lovers for the last uh, uh, 29 years, going mm -hmm. on 30 years now. Uh, it must have been very difficult, though, to justify your vows, your priestly vows, it with was. having a companion at that point. Yes. I struggled with it daily, but uh, several things about it that I noticed. Uh, first of all, I, I was entering into a ministry to gay and lesbian people, and it was very helpful for me not to just talk about gay love as a theory, mm -hmm. but to speak out of gay love, out of my own deep experience of that. And the second thing I noticed was, uh, my God of my childhood was what I call a pathological God, a God primarily of fear and mm -hmm. guilt. And through the experience of human love, I began to understand what a God of love was all about. So I found my own spiritual life getting deeper and deeper, mm -hmm. and my own ministry becoming richer as a result of my relationship with Charlie. Now, yeah. was Charlie sort of a catalyst or that relationship um, to, sort, to change the tone of your ministry or the direction? Yes, yes Because very prior definitely. to that, it had been. Uh, a traditional. A classical, traditional, right. I taught philosophy and mm -hmm. theology in Jesuit schools. But it was at this point that I decided to uh, begin a ministry directly to gay people, and I helped found the Dignity Chapter in New York City right. and began a ministry in that direction. And also I shifted into a, a graduate training as a psychotherapist in order to be able to meet, meet the psychological needs and spiritual needs of gay people coming uh, to me for help. Now, in, in those early years, well, actually not early, you had been a priest 20 years at that point. Mm -hmm. um, were you out to your congregation or were you out to no, your I was, peers? No, I was very closeted. In fact, I didn't come out until I published The Church and the Homosexual. Mm -hmm. And I was on the Tom Brokaw Today Show. It was his first day there. And one of the questions he posed to me about the book is, well, are you yourself uh, a homosexual? Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, I am, and began to talk about that. So I came out to... to the millions of, yeah, millions of viewers people. watching <laughs> national viewers television. All at once. That's not exactly my first choice, <laughs> but uh, congratulations on that. Well, it proved to be a necessity in order to not to be hypocritical and to... Uh, get across the message of the book, mm -hmm. which I hoped would be a healing message uh, for gay and lesbian people because basically the message of my book is that nowhere in Scripture uh, is there a direct condemnation of a true loving relationship between two gay men or two lesbian women, mm -hmm. and, that, and that the church ought to accept this uh, as a legitimate relationship and be willing to bless it. Well, let's, let's touch upon the book for a moment. Um, and touch is hardly the proper word to use. I mean, this First, there was a very long journey in getting this book published, mm -hmm. um, and there's been a wealth of reaction since. But tell us a little bit about the, uh, the, the process, the process and especially the, the Vatican mm -hmm. approval and how that was withdrawn. Well, uh, when I finished the book, and uh, uh, in the Jesuit order, you have to submit books uh, in this area of morality and theology uh, to your peers to be read by experts and, and given an okay or a disapproval. Mm -hmm. So I was asked to submit my book to four or five major moral theologians here in the United States. Mm -hmm. And to my provincial surprise, because he thought they would disapprove of it, all five of them approved its publication and actually fed back information to me to strengthen this part or that part, you know, out of their scientific and, and scholarly background. They were able to assist. So the book, as a result of that censorship, was a much stronger book. Mm -hmm. uh, then Rome got frightened, and uh, the Generalist Society asked me to send the book to Rome for further uh, censorship. And it was submitted again to a group of moral theologians in Rome from all over the world who read it 
and then approved it for publication so that eventually uh, Father Rupe, who at that time was general of the Society of Jesus, mm -hmm. uh, gave uh, an approval that I published the book and it, it came out with an imprimi potest, uh, an official approval. Which is approval. the v official Vatican approval. Yeah. Right. Well, it was not exactly, it wasn't directly the Vatican, it was the Society of Jesus giving me approval to publish mm -hmm. because consequently the Vatican removed that approval. Uh, after about a year's time. Right. Uh, they removed it because I became very popular on television. They saw the book as a scholarly book that only other scholars would read, but it became a bestseller mm -hmm. and started being translated into all other languages. And I was on the Today Show and the Donahue Show and the, right. uh, you know all the major talk shows. And so the American bishops requested of the Vatican that I be silenced and that the imprimi potes be removed from the book. Uh, yeah. And uh, so that did happen one year later, one year after publication. I was ordered to silence in the media and the imprimi potes was removed from the book, but the book stayed out there and continued. I did, wasn't asked to change it right. or, or any of the argumentation. Well, again, I'd like to remind our viewers that this is Forward and Out and we're here with Father John McNeil. Um, getting back to the Vatican approval and how it was withdrawn, um, you made it very clear in the preface of all of the editions of the book that this imprimi potest, you understand that because they give permission for you to publish that they don't necessarily agree with. So you know that going in. Yeah. That they that probably... did not mean agreement. It meant that they thought this was a scholarly book worthy uh, to enter into public debate or discussion. Mm -hmm. And so all, all the moral theologians thought that the church's position on homosexuality should be reviewed in light of new scientific knowledge about what homosexuality is all about, mm -hmm. the psychosexual development, in the light of new scriptural data so that uh, it became clearer and clearer that there is not a blanket condemnation of any form of a homosexual love to be found in scripture. Uh, in view of those two things, they thought the church should seriously rethink its position. Now, do I mean, the, the question that comes to mind, at least for me, in clarifying that point in the preface of your book, were you beginning to almost psychologically prepare yourself for the onslaught of reaction from the Vatican? Because I think you must have known that this was well, going to I cause. thought it was a miracle I got the imprimi potest. I still think it was a miracle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Holy Spirit did that, you know, despite human agents. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I knew there would be uh, severe consequences of having you published did. that book. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I, I was just waiting for the other shoe to fall, so to speak. Uh, and, really? and a very painful period for me, especially that nine years of silence. I obeyed and I did not speak publicly on the issue of homosexuality. But I continued you can continue a to ministry minister. quietly to, mm -hmm. you know, giving retreats and workshops and trying to help gay people who were in pain or in trouble to accept themselves and learn to live with who they were and, and develop uh, a spiritual life that was compatible with their uh, gayness or lesbianness. But I, I did not publish anything further. I did not give any interviews. I didn't do this sort of thing, you know, for nine years. Do you think that that nine-year period was, uh, was there a lot of resent on your part, having yeah. to be silent for nine oh, years? Oh, yeah, especially that, well, those were the nine years when AIDS appeared. Right. And the church got worse and worse in its reaction. Instead of studying this issue and, and gaining more enlightenment and rethinking, it just reacted negatively and badly to the whole issue, mm -hmm. uh, it, to the point of even beginning to deny uh, civil rights or urging people not to give civil rights to gay people. And so I was in great pain. I was never sure whether keeping my silence was just a religious thing of staying uh, with my vows and uh, because I took a vow of obedience to the Vatican, mm -hmm. or whether it was just cowardice of the consequences. If I spoke out, I knew I would be put out of the order and out of the priesthood, uh, not out of the priesthood, but out of my official right, right to, to be able to act as a priest. So uh, I, I kept silent for nine years until the straw that broke the camel's back was uh, Cardinal Ratzinger's Halloween letter, mm -hmm. uh, a very famous letter yes. in which he, uh, he actually said that uh, gay people have no right to new civil rights, and if they demand their rights, uh, then they're the 
they're the reason why they, they will be, uh, they'll be gay bashing and they'll be beat up. And so he sort of justified gay bashing. Right. And this coming from an official Roman source, I could no longer in conscience stay silent. So uh, I, at that time I got a letter from Cardinal Ratzinger telling me that my silence was no longer enough. I had to give up all ministry to gay and lesbians. Well, that, that's true. I mean, we can't forget that even though you were experiencing nine years of silence, homosexual, the church and the homosexual was still Out in the there. bookstores. Yeah, selling. Selling. And being translated exactly. into other languages. And the Vatican get, kept getting angrier and angrier. It was, and finally they decided to order me to give up all ministry, including my psychotherapy with gay and lesbian clients. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I was sort of happy about that because it resolved my dilemma. I, if I gave up my ministry, and especially my clients as a psychotherapist, I would violate my conscience. And I thought I would be directly violating what God's oh, will was for right, me. Right. So now I was clear. I had to say no to this order. Yeah. You know, uh, But saying no led to being expelled from the Jesuit order after 40 years, which was pretty painful. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and it, it, but it once again gave me freedom to write. During that time, I couldn't, so I had 10 years of workshops of accumulated and retreats, knowledge and experience, which I then right. pulled together in my second book, uh, Taking a Chance on God, Liberating Theology for Gays and Lesbians. And uh, I thought that was a much better book because it had d greater depth in terms of my uh, own analysis and my training in psychotherapy and my understanding of spiritual development. And I was able to apply all these insights to the normal, healthy way a gay or lesbian person could grow both spiritually and psychologically. Well, you said something very interesting in the green room before we came into the studio, that that second book didn't cause as much of a fervor as the first one. No, uh, um, the fir first book was seen as very controversial and challenging the church, but the mm -hmm. second book, since it, it, it brought a deep spiritual message, uh, spiritual and psychotherapeutic message mm -hmm. to gay and lesbian people, uh, no talk show wanted to deal with it. Uh, it was very interesting. I thought it was a much better book yeah. and would, could lead to much more interesting <laughs> TV shows or <laughs> dialogues. But on the contrary, it, it just was greeted with total silence, right. uh, it, it, both uh, on TV and basically in the press, too. There was, uh, there was nothing about Did it. Did you have a moment of wonder about that? I mean, obviously you were quite a sensation 10 years before with the first book, yeah. and here you were writing what you thought was a much more personal and powerful, and book, powerful and book and yeah. not a peep from no, the press. No, no. That's, that's very uh, fun. It, you know, the, the book spread by word of mouth among gay people, and mm -hmm. it's still selling strong, although it came out in 1988, and it's like people and a gay AA group all read it, you know, and then pass it on to their friends. So, so it did. Uh, it did do well, but mm -hmm. but not via the media. The media were no help at all in this right. in that process. Um, th this is a very odd question, but I mean, Cardinal Ratzinger and your peers, and even the Vatican, even though you were expelled from the Society of Jesus, has that? also cut off? Do you have no communication with them at this point? Well, you got to realize that the Society of Jesus did not want to expel me. They were forced to by Cardinal Ratzinger. Mm -hmm. The general was called in and get sort of given an order that, that I should be expelled, you mm -hmm. know, I, unless I obey that order to give up all ministry. And when, when the present general, Peter Hans Kalvenbach, came over, he came over from Rome and met with me at Fordham University in the Bronx, and we had a long conversation. And he told me that he admired my ministry and that if he was personally in charge here, he would not expel me, but that he was under direct orders from Cardinal Ratzker and he understood the Pope mm -hmm. uh, to have me either give up this ministry or be expelled. And therefore he had to. Uh, and then he gave me his blessing and he told me my case was almost identical to Mother Teresa. She began working with the poor in Calcutta Mm -hmm. Her order was a teaching order. She was ordered back to the classroom. She refused to go, and so they expelled her. And he said he saw a parallel, that God had called me to this ministry. It was incompatible with the Society of Jesus ministry, mm -hmm. and therefore, if, if God is calling me, I had to go and do that and take the consequence of expulsion from the Jesuits. Okay, um, this is Forward and Out, and again, we're with Father John McNeil. Um, let's talk about your latest book, 
which here is the latest book, actually. It's yet to be published. It will be hitting the bookstores when? Uh, it will be distributed in January. Mm -hmm. I think February 10th, Beacon Press is publishing it, and they've made that the official date. And then I'll be touring with that. Uh, now, the, ti the name of that book is Freedom, Glorious Freedom. Yes, and I like the subtitle, The Spiritual Journey to the Fullness of Life for Gays, Lesbians, and Everybody Else. And I, I think that's very important, because I think gays and lesbians, because of their exile status in this heterosexist culture, tend to develop a very deep spiritual life. Mm -hmm. So that uh, most spiritual leadership, perhaps in a closeted way, uh, in the human community at large, comes from the gay and lesbian members of that community. Mm -hmm. And so all this business about us being hedonistic and unspiritual <laughs> is, is pure myth and stereotype. It's on the contrary. Uh, the most spiritual people I know who are deepest into prayer life and, mm -hmm. and charismatic movements and into all the religions, you know, even into Buddhism and New Age religion and, uh, uh, and uh, all the Protestant and Catholic groups. Uh, I hold retreats every year at Kirkridge, a retreat center in the Poconos, for gay and lesbian Christians. And the depth of spirituality of the hundred people who will come to that retreat uh, is extraordinary. In fact, many, if not most of them, are involved in ministry. You know, they're mm. either priests or ministers or lay people working in the church. So there's an extraordinary uh, depth of spiritual life in the gay community that I've been working with now for 25 years. As you continue, not only in writing, but in working with dignity. Yes, yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about this book. I mean, it, obviously it's about the gays and lesbians and other people who you've experienced along the way, but um, this seems like quite a large manuscript. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it, it, it's a result of another uh, six or seven years of retreats and workshops, you know, since the publication of Taking a Chance on God. Uh, and it's, it's a book dedicated entirely to the Holy Spirit, as I say. I, I call my three books Father, Son, and Spirit. They're sort oh, of a really? trilogy <laughs> a of Trinity spiritual there. themes, yeah. you know. Uh, the key to this whole book is in the word freedom. I discovered that the ancient root of the word freedom had two simultaneous meanings, and one was to be, in the, uh, to, uh, to be a free member of the household of the master mm -hmm. and not a slave member. Uh, and the second simultaneous meaning was to be loved by the master. And so the theme of the book is that if we know we're loved by God, we're free. We're free to play life, to enjoy life. We don't have to earn that love, we just have to respond to it. Mm -hmm. And so the whole theme of the book is that God loves us, and precisely as gay and lesbian people. We're not excluded from God's love, and therefore, our whole life can be lived out as a, a response of gratitude for that love that's given to us mm -hmm. as a gift from God. And so I try to spell out all the ways uh, that we can live out uh, that love. And I end the book, or toward the end, I have two chapters dealing with God's love for gay people and the special nature of gay's love for God, because I think there are some specific qualities in the way a gay person loves God over against a heterosexual. You know, a certain passion and a depth, mm -hmm. an integration of the body and the spirit uh, in that love for God uh, uh, that's uniquely present in gay people. Do you feel a certain amount of freedom now? I mean, now having heard your story, um, do you feel a certain amount of freedom now in being yeah. able to live your life almost as you would choose at this point, yes. without the limitations of the church? And oh, un unquestionably. Yeah. To, uh, to have been put out of the society, I thought I would go into a very deep depression, because that was my family, and I loved the Jesuit order. Mm -hmm. Still do, you know. I like to say you can take McNeil out of the Jesuits, you'll never take the <laughs> Jesuit out of McNeil. Uh, but my freedom to be in a loving gay relationship, to be out publicly about that, and I like to say I don't speak about gay love, I speak out of gay love. And to realize how deeply integrated my love for my partner is integrated into God's love for me and my love for God and our mutual love for God. Uh, and this is an extraordinary joy and an extraordinary freedom. Uh, to know this, and it's a freedom I'd like to share with everybody, especially all my gay brothers and lesbian sisters. You know? Well, I think you've been doing that for the last 30 years of your life. I mean, whether mm -hmm. the Vatican approved of it or not, I think you've been doing that. Um, 
would is there I mean we'd like to actually I'd actually act like to ask you to turn to the cameras and give us a message or the, any gays and lesbians watching at this point All right. um, leave us with a message I, I think that you've had have a wealth of experience that you can draw on and having yeah. lived an active gay life for the past 40 years well I, I think the the message I would like to give is a very simple one of, of love first of all to get rid of any internalized homophobia, any fear, guilt uh, about your homosexuality, and accept it as a gift from God, a positive gift, which if you live it out properly, will bring you to God and unity with God, and eventually, I think, bring you into eternal life. Uh, so it's not something to be afraid of. In fact, uh, fear is the greatest enemy uh, for us gays and lesbians. Uh, fear, uh, internalized fear, and internalized self-hatred. And so uh, I think the first thing is to develop your own spiritual life. There's a very famous saying in spirituality, you must drink from your own well. And that's the key message of this book, freedom of conscience, that we have to base our spiritual life on our own experience. All other sources are loaded with homophobia. Sc scripture is even translated homophobically. Uh, the church, the culture, our family frequently are homophobic. And the only place where we can drink deeply from a spiritual source, which is free of all homophobia, is our direct prayer relationship with God. So well, I think most gay people should cultivate a very deep spiritual life and a very deep prayer life. And they will find great peace and joy out of that prayer life and, a, and an ability to accept and love who they are and therefore to give and receive genuine human love in, well, in a Father gay John, context. I, I'm sorry, I hate to interrupt you, but we are out of time. And I do want to thank you wholeheartedly for being with us today on Forward and Out and for giving us that message. Um, we appreciate your work and we appreciate your being here. Okay. Thank you for watching Forward and Out. Uh, t t t tune in and stay with us until the next time. And until then, be proud. Your local gay and lesbian community services center is a place to connect and get involved. Various ongoing groups and social events are conducted at or by your center, and it is also a clearinghouse of gay and lesbian information nation and worldwide. We urge you to join, get involved, and support your community. If you need information about HIV and AIDS, ARCs, AIDS-related community services, offers counseling, support groups, referrals, educational forums, and much more. Call the ARCs AIDS line at 914-992-1442. ARCs is here to help.